Hi guys and welcome to another Face Hammer Old World show. In this show, I'm going to be talking about command groups and characters and a little bit more detail how they work in the rules. Um, it might be a little bit dry this show, hopefully it's not too boring. Um, these are the kind of key concepts that I think people need to understand um, when they're getting into Old World. So if you're someone who's returning from the world that was, you'll know that this is kind of a lot of the tactics in the game were about where you put your characters, how you constructed your army lists in terms of what units were there to support and protect your characters, which, you know, delivery systems for characters, that kind of thing. So this should give you an idea of fundamentally how the mechanics work. There are some big key changes here. If you're completely new to Old World, and a few people have said in the comments they've never played it before, um, this will be very different to things like Age of Sigma, where characters operate independently, and the rules for characters joining units are quite important to understand um, because it can influence combats and other things. So I'm not going to go too in-depth in sort of tactics. Um, when I do the army list show, I'm going to talk a little bit about some arm army list concepts um, where when you're building your list, there's some things you want to put in your list, i.e. like a bunker or an anvil or a hammer, etc. I'll go into that later. And um, this video is just going to be about the rules for characters and command groups. I'm also going to do a video on unit types and formations just to make sure that's clear because I think that's quite an important thing to understand as well before writing army lists. You know, some characters can't join certain units and so on and so forth. Then I'll get into the army list show. Now, I wanted to get the beginner type of basic how to play videos out with some models and demonstrations. Um, on the weekend. Unfortunately, I've hit a bit of a snag. I can't find my original Tomb King army, which I was going to use for those demonstrations along with my Chaos Warriors. Um, so I've got my Chaos army. It needs a little bit of TLC uh, before I put it on camera. I want to sort of dust it off and so on and so forth. So I think they'll follow in the next couple of weeks, um, if I'm honest. Um, so the next couple of videos will be this one, obviously you're watching now, um, and then it will be the formation sort of immediately following, and then I want to try and get the army to show out as well, and that should give everyone enough content to consume. I am aware of a tournament on the weekend, so I won't be able to record over the weekend, so maybe um, that will cause a little bit of a delay next week. I try and get a video out every other day at the moment um, because the support's been great, and it looks like the algorithm's working and kind of picking me up and showing me to you guys, so I want to keep that ball rolling. Um, and just before I get into the video, a quick one, um, Arca sites are available um, from Pro Painted. There's a link in the description also in the QR code. There's different colours, as you can see. Got a nice maroon, a black, and a blue. Um, so there's a list. You can see them on the website. But if you order these, that helps me. If you click through the link, you get 10% off everything at Pro Painted. Um, and, you know, they're very useful. Very useful for games, especially if you play AOS. So Age of Admin is... Uh, you need a lot of tokens. Anyway, without further ado, let's get into the show. And we'll start off by talking about command groups. So this stuff might be a bit basic and a bit obvious to a lot of you. Hopefully it's not too boring. But basically, command groups, and th there are some fundamental changes with command groups, and that is that they have to be in the middle. And so you can't... Re what you used to be able to do in the old rules is push them out into second rank and have characters in the front rank, which then could limit people hitting the unit you could almost make a character barrier uh, you can't do that anymore um you you characters have to be pushed out more than the command so anyway so command group consists of a champion standard bearer a musician it might be referred to as a full command you don't have to buy them all you might just have a champion or just have a musician or don't have any of them it really depends on what the unit's doing in your army whether you want those those guys in your in your art in your unit so it depends obviously you add cost to the unit um they generally seem to be the same cost across the board so like if it's seven points for a musician it'll be for a champion and it'll be for a standard the difference is that um you can give a champion and a standard like magical stuff so they could cost more but the the base cost is the same but all three so um if you reform or turn a unit they always like go to the front so if your unit's facing one way you do an about turn they'll move it to the new front rank so they always kind of push their way um to the front and everyone else moves around them um if you like to think of it the banner's always in the middle basically um it even says that in the rules so that is a picture of a tomb guard unit with the command you've got the champion and musician 
either side of the banner, which is slap bang in the middle. That's kind of how it should look. Um, obviously, it gets a little bit more complex when we start talking about characters and units. So champions, they are basically like mini heroes that can't leave the unit. It's probably the best way to think of them. Um, so they have options to take different equipments. So they might be able to take different weapons. Like they might get a special shooting attack or a, a special like combat weapon. Um, they can also take magic items um, generally. So you might be able to take, give them like a magic sword or, or so you can see that in the magic show. It will tell you in your muster list in the actual and in your unit profiles what they can take. So under the unit entry, it will say may have standard bearer, musician, champion. They, and not every unit can have a champion, musician, standard. Like you can't give like Chaos Hounds banners, for example. They're dogs. Um, or, or Tomb Swarms, you know, so not every unit can have these. Um, if you... If you, you if you're attacking a unit, you can direct against a champion specifically. Um, so if you're in base contact with the champion, you could actually attack it. Now, generally, it's good practice if you're fighting to always put at least one attack on the champion because generally it's exactly the same as hitting a normal killing a normal trooper. And the champion adds the ability for them to have challenges and gives them extra stats, or or might have a the only difference to that might be if they've got a defensive magic item, you might want to get hit the rank and file to avoid them making that save to to you know, get more combat res. But other than that, they're basically the same. So, um, and excess wounds do not carry over. So um, unless you're talking about challenges and overkill, which we'll get onto in a minute. So that means that if you allocate like four models attack the champion and they all hit and wound and he fails all four saves, that's only one wound for combat res and that's only one model that will die because they've all really killed that champion. They've kind of stumped on it a lot. So that is kind of interesting. Um, you can't really put champions on the ends um, to stop people being able to hit the rank and file because the champion's in base contact because they've got to be put in the middle. So it's kind of the, the command always has to go centrally to the middle. Uh, standard takes precedent in the middle of the middle, if that makes sense. Um, so basically you can't do weird quirky stuff where you put the champion on one end of a line and they can only kill that champion because there's anything they're in base contact with. Um, a lot of that stuff has kind of gone away. You used to be able to do stuff like that, not anymore. You can do that with a character though, in a way. Um, so there is still some shenanigans. Um, so standards and musicians. So standards give you plus one combat res. It doesn't stack. So if you've got like four units with a standard all in the same fight, you don't get plus four. You still get plus one. Uh, battle standards do add an extra bonus. We'll get onto that later. Um, they can be lost and captured awarding victory points. I haven't really talked about winning and losing games in the channel. But basically to win and lose games, you kill things. You get victory points. So victory points come from killing units, capturing standards, killing the general. And there might be an objective like have the most table quarters or control the middle, um, which will be worth like 100 VPs or something silly like that. So when you're thinking about banners, you also need to think, are they going to be easy to capture? It's like if you've got a unit of fast cavalry that you're going to use as a screen that which as a screen is a unit that you use to block their unit so you're gonna they're gonna die do you want to give up more points by giving the banner for plus one combat res in a fight you're gonna lose anyway no so you wouldn't buy a banner for them unless there's a magic standard you really want but you wouldn't probably have a unit that you're gonna throw away with a magic banner um, so really it's, um, buying command. One of the things I'd say to anyone new, don't just automatically buy every upgrade. What you need to think is, do I need this for its role? And when I talk about army list writing, I'll go into how I decide that. I'm not saying that's the right or the wrong way. I just, that's how I do it. And I think, um, you know, I've always been quite known as a, a good army list writer, um, from back in the day. So hopefully that's useful for you as well. So really that's all a standard does. It does also allow you to take magic banners sometimes. So you need to buy the basic banner to take the magic standard. Unlike things like a magic shield where it comes with the shield, banners are different. You need to have the standard bearer upgrade to take the magic banner. You don't just get a standard bearer for having a magical banner in the unit. So you must have a magic uh, a banner to have a magic banner. Um, musicians... So one thing they used to do with Swift Reform, that's gone, I've mentioned that before. So what they do now is you, if you draw a combat, so you're tied 
a musician will give you plus one combat res. If they've also got a musician, they also get plus one. Again, this doesn't stack. So in the fight in general, if you've got a musician, you get plus one. If you tie, um, and then if they've got one as well, they get plus one. You tie naturally, it cancels out, it is a tie. So basically, the way to think of it is musicians will win on the draw, unless your opponent's got one as well. Um, and then fleeing units with a musician get to rally with plus one to their leadership test. And they also get plus one to march test. Now, a march test is if you want to march and there's an enemy within eight, I think the rule's called enemy sighted, um, you need to pass a leadership test to stay disciplined enough to march when the enemy's that close. Both musicians and standards cannot be targeted, so you can't go, I'm going to kill your banner. They are the last rank and file to die. You they don't you don't lose them unless you know you get run down or destroyed. Now, one of the things that used to happen is if you broke from combat, you would lose your banner. And then you could rally without the banner. That's kind of gone. Like they have to wipe the unit out or run it down to get your banner. You can't just, um, you know, kill the banner by breaking the unit and then they rally and then they don't lose it. Um, so one thing I would say as well that to just to capture a standard, you need to kill it in combat or run it down. You cannot shoot it with magic or bows and just or panic it off the table and get the banner you need to actually go in and physically beat it up um so that's an important distinction so um characters so characters there's a whole load of rules for characters and how they work it can probably feel a little bit overwhelming hopefully this will help break it down a little bit so i'm going to talk about um your sort of the principles of command range so a lot of spells or abilities will say in command range. Now, command range is the leadership value of the hero. So if your leadership seven, it's seven inches. If your leadership 10, it's 10 inches. The, the caveat that if you're the general or a battle standard, it's 12 inches. If you are a large target, it's 18 inches. So if you're mounted on a dragon, it'll be 18 inches. That's a huge range because it's not wholly within, it's just within. So it's point to point. If that's 18, you're in range, okay? The general is the highest leadership in the army. Um, there might be some rules about, has to be a tomb king, for example. So it might not be, but you know, generally, if you don't get a weird rule that allows you to choose a different model, it has to be the highest in the army. And if there's a tie for this, so you've got multiple characters of the same leadership, you can pick the one that's your general. Um, you cannot have the loner special rule and be a general. So if you're a loner, you can't lead an army. It kind of makes sense. Um, and the general has a rule called inspiring presence. So all friendlies within command range can use the general's leadership if they are not if the general's not fleeing. So if your general is running away, it's advised to rally that model first, and then other models can use the leadership to rally. Uh, but generally, your general projects an area of leadership. There are some restrictions on this. So, like for example, some mercenaries. Um, you know, I don't think beasts can use it. Like war beasts can't use it because they're just animals. So not everyone can use the general's leadership and it will be stated under their unit profiles or their special rules. Um, they'll have a special rule that says they can't use Inspiring Presence, for example. Um, you have the Battle Standard Bearer has some extra rules. So they add an extra plus one in combat. That's in addition to your banner. So you've got banner and a Battle Standard. That's plus two. Uh, generally, you don't have more than one Battle Standard. You can't. Um, if there's a weird situation where you've got two, um, then you still only get plus one. You don't get plus two for two different battle standards. If you're playing like in a game where you've got two people on one side and they're allied together and you've allowed each other to join each other units, yeah, it wouldn't work like that. Um, BSB lets you re-roll panic and rally tests within its command range and also re-roll break tests within command range. Now, break tests 
that's very important. It's a very good thing. Battle standards are very strong in that regard. I would say that it does say that you have to take the, the second result even if it's worse. So what this means is that you might roll your break test and fall back in good order and think, well, I don't want to fall back at all, re-roll it and then flee and then get run down. So you need to be a little bit savvy about when you use that and what the risks are involved because um, it could end up being, you know, worse. So unless you're going to break and like properly flee, you might want to think about the re-roll. But generally, it's a very strong thing to have around your units that you want to hold or you don't want to panic off. So yeah, it's very good. Um, it definitely, definitely helps. It stops you uh, losing games for random 2d6 rolls. So getting a re-roll on it is huge. Um, so we've talked about um, troop types a little bit in other videos, or I have. So what I would say, I'm going to do a detailed video on troop types and formations because it is that important. Um, so I'm not going to go into so much detail in this, but I will talk, but characters kind of modify those rules again. So characters have a troop type. Now, generally, um, this will change depending on what they're mounted on. So if they're on a horse, that will be cavalry. If they're on a monstrous mount, like a demigriff, they would be monstrous cavalry. If they're on a chariot, then they'll be a chariot, you know, so well, light or heavy, depending on what type of chariot it is. If they're on a monster, they'll be on a, a monster. If they're on a behemoth, they're on a behemoth. So depending on what they're mounted on will change. I will do a video on troop types. It's kind of important to understand how those units move and what formations those units can use and the extra special rules around those units. And um, that's not this video. I'll do that separately. Um, again, if you want more clarification on the different types of what they can do. Now, um, a character that joins a unit adopts the formation of the unit. I'm not talking troop type, as in formation. So if you join a unit that is in close order, you are now close order. If you join a unit that is open order, you'll be open order. Generally, characters are... Um, what I would call um, skirmishers. They're like loners. I've got some details coming up on that. So if they join a unit, they lose that and they became, become part of whatever unit they join. Um, now, characters on ridden monsters or chariots will adopt the formation of their mount. So if you're, like say, if you're on a light chariot, you become a light chariot and the formation of a light chariot might be close order. You'll be a close order unit, regardless of whether you're in a unit or not. Now, Characters on chariots can only join units of chariots if the chariots allow you to be a unit, basically. So you can't, it depends on the character and the, the mount and the army and what the units have. Like heavy chariots can't be joined by a character. There is an exception with Cetra, but that's in the special rule. So there's always, there's always stuff in the game that can be modified um, on the entry with other special rules, which might, like overwrite what I'm saying, but generally, um, then you have to follow these rules. So when I do the unit type one, I'll go into that in a bit more detail. But just the important distinction is, you're a skirmisher unless you're on a ridden monster or a chariot. Um, and if you join a unit, you become that formation. And formations are not the same as troop types. So troop type and formation are different. So just caveat that so it says characters and cavalry mounts so if you're on a cavalry mount that might be light heavy or monstrous you're treated as being the mount subcategory of troop type uh, not unlike any other mounted model a mounted character will have a split profile um, but there is an additional description it says when moving this model uses the movement of the mount um it says some cavalry mounts are big and tough enough that the mount will increase the character's toughness or wounds in such cases will be noted in the mount's profile so you might end up with better stats because of it excuse me um characters and ridden monsters so again um they are treated as that type that subcategory so monsters creature or behemoth um, and you get a split profile. Um, 
any special rules that apply to one element apply to the other. So for example, if the dragon causes terror, the whole model causes terror. Um, use the movement of the mount. The character and mount use their own weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, initiative, and attacks for their own weapons. So you don't hit with the rider's weapon skill when you're rolling for the dragon's attacks, for example. Um, in combat, all enemy to hit rolls are made against the character's weapon skill. Impact hit stomp attacks use the mount's strength. When you make an armor save, you use either the mount or the character, whichever is better. Some don't increase the armor save of a um, rider, for example. So you might have a save, a chariot is a good example. Chariot might have a four plus save. Character might have a four up save or five up save. If you put a character on the chariot, he doesn't get a three up save or a four plus plus. Then he adds his shield and armor. You just use the four up because it's better than the five up, if that makes sense. So... <clears throat> and if you're reduced to zero wounds, the model as a whole is removed from play. Now, some ridden monsters will improve the toughness or wounds, and it will be noted in the profile. So, for example, a dragon might say plus three toughness, plus six wounds. So you're going to add that to your character's stats. Um, now, the chariots are a little different, and I've got that here. So it says that you'll be light or heavy and treated as the same subcategory. Now, again, you've got the rules for a split profile with chariot mounts. And I've seen this question asked a lot in, in the old world Facebook group or, or like on the video comments. So basically it's similar. So you get a special rules applied to both elements. Use the movement of the beast that draw the chariot or the chariot itself. It doesn't have monsters pulling it. Um, the character, crew, and beast use their own weapon skill, business skill, strength, initiative, and attacks or their own weapons. So you can roll their attacks separately depending on what their stat line is. Enemies roll to hit against the character's weapon skill. And um, impact hits or stomp attacks use the chariot strength, not the character strength. Enemy rolls to wound are made either against the chariot or the character's toughness, whichever is highest, which is a bit different to the monstrous mount because some of those give you a bonus to your toughness. So, for example, a king in a chariot doesn't increase his toughness because the chariot has its own toughness value. You just use the better one, which would be the king, because he's toughness five and chariot's toughness four, for example. And that might be wrong. That's old, old knowledge. Um, so when a model makes an armor save, it uses either the chariot or the character's armor value, whichever is better. So again, it's you don't get to combine those saves. If it's reduced to zero wounds, the whole model's removed from play. Now, I don't know why this bit isn't in the bullet points, but here you go. It says, when a character mounts a chariot, they join the crew. Um, wounds characteristic of the chariot of the character is added to the chariot. For example, a character with wounds three is on a chariot with wounds four. It has seven wounds, so you add the wounds together. So if you join, you put a character on a chariot, you're going to have quite a few wounds, um, which makes sense. Um, you know, so I think you can get to seven wounds with a king and a chariot at toughness five, as opposed to like four wounds. I think he has, um, maybe three. They always used to have extra wounds back in the day. So, um, cool. So that's, that's profile. So you can see how troop type can be semi complicated. And again, because you become that troop type, you get extra special rules depending on the troop type, like lumbering or grinding wheels or firing platform. So those rules are going to be covered in the other video when I talk about troop types in general. And I'll talk about skirmishes in that video, open order, close order, and all that good stuff. So lone characters. So infantry and cavalry are lone characters. Now infantry and cavalry have subcategories like light heavy monstrous so if you're on a monstrous mount not a monster mount but like a monstrous cavalry mount you are still a lone character if you're not in a unit you move and see like a skirmisher which basically means 360 degrees and you can freely pivot um if you join a unit you lose those benefits because you join the unit you become part of that unit you adopt their formation 
um, evade. So this is a rule that's been put in, which means that unless you're in your fleeing or already in combat, if an enemy unit contacts you via pursuit, um, you can dodge out of the way. So you take an initiative test, and if you pass it, you can make a normal move, get out of the way, basically. So why is this useful? Um, for example, rather than putting your wizard inside a unit, you could stand outside of the unit, and if they have somehow fight that unit and break them and then run, run them down, and they would hit your wizard, you could take the initiative test to move the wizard out of the way. So it could be quite good. It's just another layer of protection for heroes on foot or, or, or on, on deed on horse if they're not in a unit. Now, there's another layer of protection, which is targeting lone characters. I've just taken the diagram here because it makes it a lot clearer. So basically, I think I've covered this in another video as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I've done this, talked about this before. So um, it says a lone character might offer a desirable target for a shooting or a spell. However, it's difficult to shoot them. So a lone character cannot be targeted by enemy shooting or spells whilst it's within three inches of a friendly unit that is not fleeing and contains five or more models of the same troop type as the character, i.e. infantry or cavalry. Now, that doesn't say heavy infantry or, you know, so if you've got a heavy infantry character and they're within three inches of a infantry unit, like normal infantry, they still benefit because this is not a subcategory. So cavalry is light, heavy, and monstrous cavalry. So you could be on a monstrous cavalry mount and a unit of light cavalry is screening you, you would get that benefit, which is important to understand. And basically it says here, this diagram, here, unit A wants to shoot, but it doesn't apply if they're the closest. So it can shoot orc boss two, easily because he know he's within three inches of this other infantry unit he's closest so he's shootable this orc boss here is also a viable target line of sight permitting um is that he is not within three inches of a unit so not him not being close doesn't really matter um whereas unit character one the sneaky grot shaman is basically not targetable if that makes sense so you can't shoot at one you can shoot at two and you can shoot at three see line of sight permitting so how do characters join units and how does that work so a character can join a unit when you deploy them so you can deploy them in a unit mm -hmm or during the remaining moves phase by moving into base-to-base -base contact with a unit. A unit cannot move after a character joins it. So if you move into a unit, and the way this would work, you could move and touch the back of a unit, then be placed in the fight and rank. The unit cannot then move. However, you could move the unit into position and then join it with a character. Um, you might be able to do some stuff by getting extra range doing this because you could join the back of the unit and then you jump to the front. So you might better do and because movements before shooting and you magic spells go off in the shooting phase, you might be able to get some extra range on your vortexes or your um, magic missiles. You cannot join characters to each other. So you can't get two characters and put them together and form their own unit. You need to have something that they've joined they can't join each other so you can't put like three heroes in one unit that doesn't make doesn't work i mean they used to there was something like that in the past which was really balked um if they they become subject to any spells and effect on the unit and vice versa so i think i was thinking about this when i did the magic show if you had the ethereal spell on i think it's walk between worlds um, and you you can't join a non ethereal unit, but because you when you join a unit they gain the ethereal rule, then you you probably can, and uh, vice versa. So if you have a unit with that on and you want to join another character in, 
you probably can because they would get affected by it as well because they're part of the unit. So it's basically just saying, and the same with hexes, if you've got hex on the unit and you join it, then you're going to get hexed as well. Um, so basically it's just to say that, that when the unit's in effect, or well, the character's got an effect, joining unit won't get rid of a hex. In fact, it will spread it um, and vice versa. If a unit runs away, the character has to run away to split even if it's got unbreakable, it doesn't matter. You've joined a unit. I think unbreakable, you can't join non-unbreakable. But anyway, uh, but if you've got a special rule that means you don't run away, like but the unit runs, you run with it. If the unit gets run down, you also get run down and slain. So you you go with the unit, the majority rule here. Um, now, characters have to be placed in the front rank. However, one of the important distinctions here, you used to get pushed into the second rank, now you get pushed to the rear rank, it says. So I don't know if there'll be an FAQ clarifying this, but it sounds like your character goes right at the back if you can't get in the front. And because um, there are some rules around not enough space and command groups having to be in the front, um, you can't make super deaf stars. Caveat that, you can, but just be a line of heavy cavalry in one line and you're fine. Uh, or be wide enough that it doesn't matter. Um, then you've got, um, uh, if they leave a unit, they do in the remaining move subphase by moving away before the movement unit moves. And if you want a unit of archers that have got standstill, um, if you join that unit, they don't count as moving, but the character does. So like if you join, I don't know, like an engineer into a unit of handgunners, the handgunners aren't going to suddenly get minus two for moving because they haven't moved. Um, but the character would if they had one, if that makes sense. Um, what's important here, and I've mentioned it on the big changes of the, of the game, you cannot charge a character out of a unit on their own. So in the past, you used to have like a, char a unit that could protect the character from shooting, but you didn't want to charge the unit with a character. You just want the character to charge out on their own. You can't do that anymore because the only way you can leave a unit is in the remaining move subphase. So there's no way to charge out of a unit with a hero. So if you want to have a hero who's operating independently, then they need to be independent when you charge. Um, which kind of makes sense. I'm glad about that. I think that's a good change. Um, then you've got this. I put this little diagram in to show you because it says that a unit has unit A has been joined by two characters which are placed in the front rank of the unit, displacing three rank and file models to the rear. Now, what you'll notice about those bases is they are the same size or they're divisible. So the cavalry mount, which is a 25 by 50, is the same size as two 25 by 25s back to front. So it neatly can displace models. Now, Unit B, on the other hand, has been joined by a 30 by 30 orc war boss, and he cannot fit without causing problems with alignment. So what happens then is you put them on the flank adjacent to the front rank. And obviously there's only two positions for this, so I don't think you can add like three or four characters like this. Now, this might initially look like a hindrance, but actually this does get around some of the problems of you having to displace uh, into the back rank because you can't fit. So you might might be able to do some tactical things here because because you join the flank of a unit, um, you you wouldn't worry too much about the the, the command models and not enough room for the characters. Um, and also that means your character's on the end. So if you have a defensive character, that can kind of help with limited attacks coming in. Um, I know in the old rules, there was rules about tracing across the gap. So, you know, if you, if you charged in here, you would, you would trace across this gap, basically, um, whether or not that that's the case. I haven't, um, seen that yet, but I, I don't know. Um, maybe I've missed that. Um, but let me know if you've seen that. Um, so, yeah, so characters, um, you know, they, they have to join, they can go in the unit, but if they've got a weird base that doesn't fit, then they have to go on the end, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so, a little bit more rules. So when you measure um, 
to the character as normal for command range. So what I mean by that is if you join this unit, say, for example, you're here, you wouldn't measure from the unit extending your command range. You'd measure from the character still. So things like their special rules or if they've got a missile weapon or they've got a spell is from that model, not from the unit. However, if you are shooting or measuring to an enemy unit with a character on the end, then you can measure to that character. So if we go back to this diagram, this is the unit for the enemy. So if you're shooting and this guy's in range and these are not, the unit is in range. So it's an important distinction that, yes, they count as the unit for measuring to the unit, but when they are using their abilities or their spells, they the unit doesn't count for their range. You have to measure from them. I hope that makes sense. So arc of sight for the unit as well. So the arc of sight with a character on the end is the corner of the character's base, and then you can use your your nice little handy arc of sight template and you put that on the end and you go, oh yeah, that's what I can see. Um, so yeah, your your character is the front edge, even if they're sticking out on the edge. You don't ignore them, basically. Um, and again, it's like, if you need to determine character's line of sight, you do something with the character, not the unit. If And it's the same with measuring their spell ranges, their shooting attacks mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Now, units always move at the slowest rate. So if you join a cavalry model into an infantry unit, you're going to move at the speed of the infantry, generally. Um, and then your characters may also move through the ranks into a fighting position. So, for example, in this here, they've been flanked. Um, and the character that's on this corner um, is going to go, I'm going to move to the fighting rank so they can swap here. So it's just showing you here that when you move through the ranks, you're displacing a model here or you're moving on to the end. So basically you can, if you're required to move to a fighting rank. So there's a bit where you get a choice to make way. Um, and that's the inactive player gets to do that first. Um, so if their character's not in the fight and they want them in the fight, they can uh, make way to be in a fighting position. Now, some more rules. So, um, <laughs> so for shooting, um, the character must shoot the same target as the unit they have joined. It does not apply to magic missiles and magical vortex, vortex spells. Um, if the enemy shoots at a unit with a character in it, you can't pick the character out unless the weapon specifically says you can. Um, there might be a magic weapon that allows you to or an ability that allows you to. If they are under a template, they might get hit because their template has its own rules. Um, or if there are fewer than five rank and file models in the unit, then you are eligible to be hit. And the way that works is that hits are equally allocated to each model by the controlling player, starting with the unit and then equally among the unit and the characters. So, for example, if you've got three, you know, rank and file left and a character and you get hit 10 times, then you would say, well, that's four hits is one on each. Then another four hits would be one on each. And then you've got two hits to allocate. So you can either allocate one to the character, one to the unit, or two to the unit, um, as equally as you can, basically. So it's, it's a hit with one until you start doing it again um it's sometimes useful to do that with dice and you you rank the dice up next to the models specifically it does happen every now and again if you have five or more rank and file models and a character is hit by a cannon or a template um then on a two plus the units hit instead so even if you've got a weapon that says you can pick out a character they'll get lookout sir uh, as long as there's five or more rank and file in the unit they're in um, unless the rule says cannot use lookout, sir, if you make sense. Um, in combat, they can only be hit by models that are in base contact by allocating their attacks to their model. Um, impact hits and stomp attacks can only hit them if there's fewer than five rank and file in the unit, which is quite interesting. 
um, they use because um, stomp and impact it used to be allocated like shooting in the combat phase. It doesn't work like that anymore. They're just attacks at a different initiative step. Um, I think always strike first initiative ten. Um, so there you go. Um, and unless a unit is a single rank, the fighting rank cannot contain more characters than rank and file. So this is what I was saying about not being able to chock the front rank out with hard characters and putting the infantry behind for rank bonus and outnumber without the rank and file being in danger of being hit. You used to be able to do that with like um, Heralds of Nurgle and Palaquins and then one one champion in the middle and the banner musician in the second rank and then you were like, I've got loads of static rares, you can't touch them. The battle standards in the second rank as well with the war banner and you, like literally it was like an horrendous unit to try and beat uh, in combat because it was tough as well and it was I mean psychology and all the rest of it. Um, excess wounds do not spill over to or from characters. So if you allocate attacks to a character and you kill it four times, those extra wounds are just wasted. And if you wipe the unit out completely, um, those extra wounds don't go onto the character. So if you've got 15 models and a character and you shoot it and you kill 30 models, the character is still going to be fine because it wasn't eligible at the start um, to be allocated because there was more than five rank and file. Obviously, it means the next unit that shoots could just shoot the character if they can. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, interesting to know that wounds do not spill over. Um, so challenges. Now, challenges work pretty much the same. They always have. So you issue a challenge. Um, so effectively, once you get into the fight step, I think it's step 1.1 of the fight phase. Um, the active player can issue a challenge. You must be within or adjacent to a fighting rank. Um, and the same is true for accepting. So, for example, you choose the model you're issuing with. So you might say, I'm going to issue a challenge with my champion or I'm going to issue a challenge with my Chaos Lord or whatever. Now, the accepting model... Um, can be any other character in that unit so depending if they're within a position to accept um if you refuse then the player who issued that challenge can pick one of the characters in the unit and say um no nah, you're not fighting then and that the worst thing about that is you cannot benefit get any benefit in the unit from their special rules or their leadership so i think if you had any sort of buff or anything that that would apply to the unit you would lose that because they're not um they're not fighting you've you've they've been pushed back they're not given any benefit um and it says in here that um you cannot refuse if you're engaged on all four sides or the last remaining model or you're not part of a unit so if you're like a single character you don't really have anywhere to hide. You, you've got to take the challenge. You're not allowed to refuse it. Um, once you accept, you try and move the models into base contact. That might be by making way. It does say it's perfectly acceptable not to do that if it's awkward. So now there used to be some stuff around, oh, I could issue a challenge, therefore you're going to lose attacks because the models, because you can't attack a model in a challenge. Only the models in the challenge can fight each other. So it could have a point where you lose attacks on the unit because they're now only in base contact with the character, but they can't hit the character because the character's in a challenge with someone else. So there's going to be a lot of nuance around this. I think uh, maybe wait to the FAQ might clarify this a little bit with some examples would be good to see like, here's a situation you've issued a challenge. Therefore these two models now can't fight anymore. Um, and so I need to have a little bit more time with the game and hopefully I've got a few questions which aren't clarified by the rules. So I don't want to say categorically how it works when I'm not sure myself. So I'm hoping that the, um, the FAQ comes out because generally can only hit things in base contact with you. Um, if that's the character and only the character and that character is in a challenge, then you're not technically in base contact with anything. So you can't, you can't hit the unit, um, which is how it always used to work. Uh, but there is that caveat which says you don't have to move. So you could say, well, actually, that makes it awkward. Let's not move. And then you would be able to hit the unit because the character kind of, they kind of step out to the side and fight, which to be honest, I think should be the way it should be done anyway. You just take the models out separately and it doesn't affect and you can't then block attacks or, or lose lose fighters because of that. But hey-ho. If you 
kill and, and you keep fighting until someone dies. So you might be do they die straight away or you might be in locked in combat for a while. OK, if you kill a model in the challenge, like really kill it, the excess wounds do count to combat res up to a maximum of plus five. So one of the common tactics would be, oh, I've got a unit champion. You've charged me. I'm going to challenge you out with the unit champion and ha ha ha. I've got three ranks and a banner. He's only got one wound, so I win by three. Um, no, because they can overkill. So, you know, and also what's important is that if you're on a mount, the mount fights in the challenge as well. And because different elements have got different initiative, you still roll all the attacks, even if you've killed the model already. So if you've done your impact hits and you've killed the champion already, then you would say, well, I'd still roll all my attacks to get my overkill. So you roll everything even if they die straight away. Um, and that allows you to get your plus up to plus five. So if you kill a one wound champion, that's six combat res. Of course, it does mean that you're not killing any of the models in the unit. So it's a common tactic to challenge out of a unit champion. Um, so there are things you can do to get around that by charging two characters in, and then they can't challenge out both um, and other things like that. So there are some tactics around that. You know, have a supporting flying character to go in with your with your dragon lord in the front, and then the dragon can go go ham. Um, and some models have rules where they have to issue. So, like some of the Grail knights, some things have to issue, and some units have every rank and file can accept an issue. Like Grail knights, I think is one of the ones. So, and Bretonians don't like refusing challenges because they'll lose their blessing. But no one really refuses challenges because it's it's just detrimental. Um, so there's a whole little sub game of challenges uh, in, in the combat phase. So that should give you an overview of characters and command groups and how they interact with units and, and how they work. I hope that was useful for you guys um, and clarified some questions you might have. If you've got any further questions, you can put them in the comments below. If you've um, the, you know got some, some insight for me, I, I do read the comments as much as I can. It's been a bit hard to keep up with it over the last week or so because the engagement's been amazing. So thank you everyone again. Thank you to everyone who's newly subbed. If you haven't subbed, if you do sub, it's great because it, it helps the algorithm get my content to more people. Uh, next video will be about unit types and subtypes and formations. And then I will get into army list design and writing effective army lists. And the example I'm going to use is a Chaos Warriors army because I've got my Chaos out of loft and I want to make a list with them. Uh, and I'm going to go through my thought process of how I write the list and also the, the principles of army list writing, like how it works. But on top of that, I will talk tactically how I choose what I take and what I don't take and what roles I have. And then there's no, there's no rule called battlefield role, but I kind of, in my head, I want a unit to do a specific thing uh, or multiple things. And I want to have certain things in my army to be effective. And I'll talk about that in detail. Hopefully that's something you're interested in. If it is, and hit the bell, you'll get notified when the video goes live. I'm trying to put a video out every other day. Um, I am away at the weekend, so it's probably going to slow down a little bit over the next week. Um, but thank you everyone who's engaging. Um, and uh, it's been great so far, so keep it going. And uh, I'll catch you all in the next one. Cheers, guys. Bye.